Right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for, for the, this event, and thank you for your patience. So we'll, we'll kick off now. Um, we are going to um, talk about an important topic that, that matters now to everyone, really, and that's climate adaptation. Um, it is receiving a lot of attention, not surprisingly, because of so many extreme weather events that have been happening lately and particularly this year and, and the last summer. There are so many floods and, and droughts that happen throughout the world and particularly in areas that never seen these extreme weather events before. So adaptation has become an important part of our action and our response to climate change because also we left it so late really to reduce emissions deeply as required by, by 2030. So we have to do the two things in parallel now. Keep reducing emissions as fast as possible by 50% in the next seven years, and at the same time build our adaptation capacity. So what we want to do at this event is hear from countries' experiences in, in dealing with adaptation in the agri-food systems, in, in food and agriculture, uh, and at the same time, this is also our opportunity to bring some evidence to this area. In addition to these case studies, this is an opportunity for us to launch our report today on agriculture and adaptation and how adaptation is important for this sector. So there are some case studies and some important messages there for countries and farmers and others to, to, to benefit from. So we will start um, our um, session with um, an introduction and I'm really honored to invite Maria Elena Semedo, our Deputy Director General from FAO, who will give some opening remarks. Thank you, Zituni, and uh, good morning to all. Welcome to FAO Pavilion. We are I'm very happy to be here with you and to talk about climate solutions. And as Zituni mentioned, to launch the FAO publication on catalyzing climate solutions for adaptation in agri-food systems. And the importance of talking about adaptation in this, in this COP I don't think I need to say why it is important. And you see, it has been in all the headlines how the negotiators are trying to reach a goal for adaptation. Also, the Adaptation Report 2023, launched by UNEP, states that adaptation progress is slowing in all fronts as climate impacts rise. Implementing adaptation action through system level and synergetic responses is urgent. FAO has undertaken a global analysis of agri-food systems in the national determined contribution to help us understand where we are and what we can do. And there are four key points coming from this analysis. One, food and water insecurity are the most frequently reported climate-related risks in NDCs. Second, 94% of NDCs adaptation sections have agri-food systems as a priority. Third, floods, droughts, and land degradation are the most common climate-related hazards addressed by agri-food systems adaptation efforts. And four, adaptation in agri-food systems requires multidimensional responses, including ecosystems, institutional, behavioral, and technological infrastructure-based option. Namely that we need to have this multi-sectoral uh, response. But we can see the commitment and focus is increasing here. I think all of us, we are aware and we know that if you want to reach 1.5 degrees, we need to invest in adaptation. Now we must ensure that agri-food systems are integrated into international discussion 
with a focus on solutions. We know that we need to adapt, but what are the solutions? And this is why FAO is launching this publication on catalyzing climate solutions, an introduction of false work on climate change adaptation in agri-food systems. is a catalog of solutions that have worked around the world that the farmers can scale up, the government can utilize. And it shows how FAO puts local communities in the driver's seat to develop effective and efficient adaptation strategies tailored to specific local context and needs. And during today's event, you learn more on how FAO, countries and communities implement adaptation actions. Dear friends, transforming agri-food systems is a key to achieving climate goals. The impacts of climate change are with us now, and we are experiencing them every day. So, the words must show real leadership and action now on adaptation as much as mitigation and agriculture has the possibility we adapt and at the same time you can bring co-benefits for mitigation and vice versa. With the right, right national strategies and policies, countries can address link challenge from food and water security to biodiversity loss and, and land degradation. Political will is increasing. Under the lead of COP28 presidency, FAO and partners have created a COP28 Agriculture, Food and Climate National Action Toolkit, which we are launching today to support countries on the implementation of the Emirates Declaration on Resilience, Food Systems, Sustainable Agriculture and Climate Action is also a solution or a contribution, not a solution, to the implementation of the Emirates Declaration. And this morning, the minister announced that they have already 150 countries have signed the declaration. FAO is fully committed to the Sharm el Sheikh joint work process with the upcoming launch of the joint support program in Sharm Agriculture Initiative. Despite these initiatives, there is a big investment gap. The share of climate-related development finance invest in agri-food system in 2021 was less than 20% and is declining. You see the trend is very worrisome. This investment also is, is declining, but at the same time is not reaching the small-scale farmers, the herders, the fisheries, the forest dwellers, and food workers, who provide over 80% of food in many developing regions. FAO is supporting countries, this is what we are doing, to access climate finance through channels such as the, great, the Green Climate Fund and the Global Environment Facility and bilateral funding and also supporting through FAO resources. For example, FAO Jeff portfolio alone has held 1.3 billion across 280 projects. Thanks to a generous contribution of the Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture of Germany, FAO is also supporting the Food and Agriculture for Sustainable Transformation Partnership, which was launched in COP27, called the FAST, and which will be launched this afternoon. FAST aims to improve the quantity and quality of climate finance for agri-food system. But we all must do more. To move our discussion forward and listen from you what you think we can do and how we can do more, let me, I don't know, I don't think I need to introduce our moderator, Zituni Uldada. Zituni is the deputy director of FAO in the Office of Climate Change and Biodiversity and Environment, and he will be leading us towards this discussion today. Over to you, Zituni, and thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much, Madam Simedo, and thank you for setting the scene and highlighting the, the important aspect of um, adaptation, particularly the investment gap and the fact that very little of climate finance goes to smallholder farmers. 
um, and also um, the implementation of adaptation as part of, of climate action. Uh, and the catalogue of solutions that is included in um, this publication that uh, Madame Semedo highlighted. So please take a time to look at it. There is a lot of information there. There's a lot to share. And just to give you a, a flavor of that, uh, we'll have a, a panel discussion where we hear uh, some experiences from countries, from Senegal, from Kenya, from Panama, and hopefully from Mongolia as well, if our speaker is here. But hopefully they might j join us um, later on. But let me invite the speaker from Panama, Lydia Castro de Duens. She's the Director of Climate Change at the Ministry of Environment. You can join us, yeah? And uh, Lamine Diata uh, from Senegal, the officer in charge of agriculture, forestry, and land use. Please join us. And Linda Ugalo, uh, climate information services expert from Kenya. And I don't think our uh, speaker from Mongolia is here. Uh, we have also... Um, a colleague from uh, EAT, uh, Joseph Robertson, who is joining us online. So we have to see if we can connect him. So the colleagues at the back, see if we can uh, connect him, please. Perfect. So c can you hear us, Joseph? Perfect. Okay. I think I'll, I'll join you there for, for the discussion. If I can have a mic... Okay, well, thank you, um, the panelists, for joining us and Joseph for being with us on, online. Um, when, when the colleague from Mongolia comes here, then uh, they will join us. That would be really good. So we can have um, different perspectives from different countries of how adaptation is, is being addressed in, in this context. Um, so, Ligia, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, particularly on the importance of maximizing climate and environmental benefit, uh, looking at the, the case of Panama and Panama's system's approach to adaptation uh, for forest systems and, and other in, environment. So if you could please share with us some, some examples of ongoing forest-based adaptation efforts. Well... Um, first of all, uh, I'm not Lia, I'm Maribel Pinto, I'm Head of Adaptation Department, the Mr. Minister of Environment. Uh, Lia, the, who is the Head of Delegation, is at another meeting, <laughs> so I apologize for that. For, well, for Panama, just, uh, we just finished a project a few months ago related to how we can improve uh, the use of the land and the, also the, the um, hydrological resource. Uh, in that way we we start um, we work with different producers around the, the, the country uh, related to how to use agriculture um, hydroecological system how to produce uh, scenarios to try to understand how the future scenarios about the climate change is going to affect the producer all the uh, land use also the producer of the, the food in that way, we work with the uh, different communities to try to um, f uh, empower the capacity, uh, the capacity building or the um, activity that you, the youth, they you use. Uh, also, uh, we work all we work with like a, a um, two hundred uh, producer or eight, and also hectare of coffee to. Avoid affect the different ecosystem related. Yeah, uh, related to the ecosystem around their their, uh, their the area they when they work. So, uh, in that way, we try to use the last scenario that Panama produced to uh, related to temperature, how the temperature affects the different um, food that we produce in Panama. Um, 
Also, uh, we just started to work with uh, our national adaptation plan. For us, uh, we work uh, related to our NDC. We have 10 sectors, and one of these sectors is related to agriculture and um, agriculture and aquaculture also. So uh, with the NDC, we have our commitments, but also with our NAP, we try to implement the measurement that can try to uh, build in the resilience of different communities that depend on this, uh, this sector. So yeah, that's the experience for Panama. Great. Now, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that. And I can see that our speaker from Mongolia is here. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I'll, I'll hand over to you the, the, the microphone and ask you the, the question um, from, from your perspective in, in, um, in your country, particularly the, the challenges related to the institutional uh, coordination. Uh, so if you could share with us, um, you know, Mongolia's experience in overcoming these institutional coordination barriers. Mm -hmm. And so the, good, good morning to everybody. So for the Mongolian uh, policy and the level case, that we have the very good in the coordination. So we have, I, I think so, because in the initiative of the president of Mongolia, so he, uh, he, uh, he is introducing the one of the, the very comprehensive the policy on food and soil and also in the agriculture and the sector. That is the very much in the um, link in the, between the Minister of Environment, Minister of the Agriculture and all the living the ministries. So uh, from the last year, so we are in the making of promotion of the infrastructure to healthy food, healthy in there, uh, healthy in the agriculture system in Mongolia in this situation. So also the president in the institution uh, sometimes they work together with us, especially at the policy level, sometimes for the implementation level. In the implementation level case, local government's role is very important for the, the food and the safety actions. Because in, in, in the intersector and the corporation, for example, in the, between the Minister of Environment and Minister of the Agriculture, we can do the very good in the policy. Well, we can introduce, we can deliberate the very good in the policy in the level of the national. However, so implementary case, they have the key role. Now, despite the, the capacity building of the over the policy, over the achievement, yeah, so we can't do. And then, so for the decent action case, the very relevant to the local government in the action, especially in the provincial level, the action is the one of the current the, uh, step for the, uh, for the, uh, for the introducing the, that in the actions. This is not so very good the step to us. But it, it is undergoing, undergoing. And then, so maybe 2026, we can see what is the result of the comprehensive policy uh, based on the initiative of the president of Mongolia. Great. Now, thank you very much. Uh, before I, I continue with the panelists, I just want to say that we will have time to, to hear from you, the audience, if anyone wants to share with us your experience in your country or your organization. So please feel free to, to come in. So just raise your hand. There will be a mic. And then it will be nice to hear from you if you have something you want to, to bring to this discussion. Uh, Lamine, for, for Senegal... Um, you know, the, the adaptation um, work and, and action by government, it, it involves many people and it has to be centered around people and other stakeholders. So perhaps if you could share with us, you know, your process of involving different stakeholders in the adaptation action in Senegal. Okay, thank you, Zutuni, for give, uh, giving us this opportunity to share our experience uh, at country level. Yes, uh, Senegal is... Uh, uh, um, a very high vulnerable country to climate change because we are least developed country and we are also located in the Sahelian belt uh, which one is experiencing a lot of drought uh, for several years and agriculture is feeding around 70% uh, of the population live uh, through agriculture so this sector is very important that's why when we were planning our national adaptation plan, uh, we know that adaptation is discussed or planned at uh, the line ministries at national level, 
but the implementation is at local level. So uh, we are trying to see how we can better link national level and local level. And at local level, we have uh, uh, local uh, governments because uh, we have what we call the, the policy of decentralization when we provide some uh, skills or competencies to uh, local governments uh, to provide something. So at national level, for the uh, NAPS, uh, we start by uh, vulnerability st uh, studies to see how climate change affect people, what are their livelihoods, and uh, when climate change also affect, what are the other solutions people are using? Because uh, sometimes they have uh, livestock, they have uh, forestry product, and sometimes also it's migration. It's part of uh, also the, their solution. So uh, we were looking also at the local level, at the national level, how climate change is mainstream in their uh, policies. And we start by uh, that one. And at local level, we know that climate change was not so uh, mainstream in their uh, planning systems. And we're working around uh, two years to develop tools and strategies to see how they can mainstream because the ministry in charge of local government was saying, okay, I'm very keen to uh, mainstream climate change into my, uh, in the local uh, planning systems, but how to do that? When we are doing for our systems, we have tools for every step. And for climate change, what are tools? And we're working hardly with FAO to develop uh, those tools to mainstream uh, climate change, to, to mainstream also gender, to mainstream uh, migration and food security. In, in, and now those tools are available. And we were also working with the uh, FAO through the SAGA project uh, to conduct some vulnerability studies at the regional level, considering our six uh, agroecological regions. Because from another one to, uh, to from an agroecological region to another one, uh, the climate conditions are not the same. So to ensure that we will be pushing for something workable or actionable on the ground, we need to consider those ecological region. And with FAO, we have developed two regional uh, studies that show the vulnerabilities of people. But we don't stop there, because it's important to come to say to, uh, uh, to someone, you are vulnerable to climate change, but it's better if you help him to understand that vulnerability and to develop solution together and to put those solutions into a strategy and uh, a project plan. And with FAO, we had some regional strategies for climate change, and we are act actually working with those people to see how we can develop projects we can submit to GCF or we can submit to other climate finance processes. At the uh, institutional level also, it was very important because uh, climate strategies has to be implemented by line ministries, and we have to ensure that at those ministries, we have a, a better institutional arrangement for, 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 for that one. And uh, we have worked a lot uh, to build those internal arrangements, but also uh, to build capacities for them to be able to implement and to, uh, to assess and to do the monitoring and the evaluation of those strategies. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. Now, thank you for sharing all that experience. It's very helpful. And also, you mentioned the, the SAGA project, that uh, strengthening adaptation in agriculture that is supporting Senegal and Haiti and, and Côte d'Ivoire and in um, implementing adaptation in, in the uh, national adaptation plans. Uh, so Linda, for, for Kenya, um, if you could share with us um, the experience with local communities efforts and the uh, issue of addressing gender as well, that would be very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the uh, project that we implemented uh, with FAO in Kenya, we also did in Uganda, and we also did with in, in Ethiopia as well. And of what we're trying to do was try to figure out what are the gaps in terms of when climate information is generated. Um, are the communities getting it in time? Are they getting it in the right format? Are they able to understand it? Um, what are the mediums that they're using to, to receive this information? And then through FAO, we set up um, pilot farms at the local communities, not just to give them the information in terms of what the climate will do, but to demonstrate how then they can be able to use this information in our, um, to improve agriculture. 
we were also able to give them um, water harvesting um, equipment. And the project began in 2019. And this is relevant because this happened through a pandemic. This happened through a two-year drought. And communities, a lot of those communities in, in all the countries were still able to um, be able to build resilience. So it, it showed how giving access to climate information and giving access to show, demonstrating how they can harvest water when they have it can be able to help communities withstand um, harsh conditions, economic conditions, not just um, that are impacting their region, but uh, generally, globally. And in gender in particular, what we learned um, was, and I think there were some challenges, I think, in that aspect, because uh, when we were not intentional about um, the gender aspect, we would ask the governments to give us people, and most of the times when we'd have a planning at a subnational level with government officials, we'll end up with a very gender skewed in one direction. So we had to be very intentional in terms of um, letting the government know that we would like their, uh, the numbers present to be representative of both women and men. And so being intentional about ensuring that we have this was, was uh, enabled us to be able to reach a wider community. But also we, even in terms of communication, when we did our research, we found 60% of the communities use radio to get climate information. But when we looked at the data further, we found that was more common for men. If you want to you reach women, especially older women, and you use radio, 80% of the women above a certain age were not listening to radio. They want to listen to, um, they want to get their information from agricultural extension offices. So looking deeper at the, at the data kind of helped us catch those things that you don't catch when you just go with the larger numbers yep. in order to produce climate information. Great. No, thank you. That's very useful what you said. I mean, many people think, you know, that channel of communication applies to everyone. But it's interesting to see that it's not the case. Um, uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, Joseph, you still online with us? I'd like to, to bring you in, so if we could connect with you. And um, so you heard some experiences for, for different countries here, and you can see um, there are still gaps you know, in financing and other areas where um, adaptations still have to be really brought up the front. So it would be useful just to hear from you, you know, what else you know, is needed really to scale up uh, action on adaptation from, from your perspective. Uh, all of you today. Um, you know, uh, so the work that I do at EAT um, is focused on the Good Food Finance Network. Good Food Finance is a way of talking about a transformation in finance so that we can deliver all of these different non-financial benefits that we know are needed uh, on climate, on sustainable development, human health, nutrition, et cetera. Um, when the Good Food Finance Network set out to identify ways to scale up food system investment, there are a couple of things that relate to adaptation that became apparent very quickly. Um, one of them was that there are huge gaps all across the value chains that comprise the food system where finance simply doesn't reach. Um, the other is that non-financial benefits and adaptation uh, success stories consist of a lot of non-financial benefits, um, they're difficult to build into financial arrangements. And so innovation needs to happen and cooperative financing needs to happen. There are incredible challenges related to agricultural adaptation, some of which uh, I think at the political level haven't begun to be addressed. For instance, ecosystem migration and how countries can manage that challenge. Um, it's not always a bilateral problem, um, but it, it's a, a multinational problem. In order to be able to assess and understand these multidimensional variables, we need to create models of financing that are optimized to deliver those benefits. So can we deliver financing to small scale actors in remote areas who don't have access to data, technology, or financial services. 
There are ways to do that. Certain small and medium-sized enterprises are the ideal right-scaling agents to be able to help bring data down to scale, to disaggregate large flows of finance, to work together with extension agents, potentially with uh, other community organizations, with FAO and other agencies. Um, but ultimately, we recognize there's a need to create a new kind of coordinating and financing mechanism for food systems transformation. And we're now calling that the Good Food Finance Facility. One of the first things that will happen as that facility gets turned on is the delivery of readiness assistance to seven countries that are part of a multi-country grant that we have worked to put together with the Scala team at FAO that's scaling up uh, climate ambition on land use and agriculture. Um, and this is an incredibly important step forward because these are countries that need not only to learn uh, essentially how they can interact with this entirely new type of mechanism, but where those gaps, where financing doesn't reach, in many ways dominate their food system. And so if we can start to stitch together those aspects of the food system that are under attended by financial resources. Um, we can start to identify what success looks like, and then we can start to backstop co-investments and catalytic funding with accountability services that include not only strong guidance grounded in science and evidence in terms of what to invest in, but also integrated data systems that are capable of delivering multi-dimensional performance insights, meaning that they can tell us that while this financial intervention generates better value financially, it also generates better better value in terms of climate resilience, in terms of uh, watershed resilience, in terms of the health of ecosystems, in terms of human health, access to nutrition, and the ability to deliver better sustainably produced food to more people affordably. If we can put all of those things into multidimensional metrics, relying on underlying data systems that are talking to each other and that are starting to value what has been essentially hidden from the marketplace, then we can start to show investors, not just development institutions, but mainstream private sector investors, where adaptation is investable, especially where it's going to significantly reduce vulnerability and build macro scale resilience for communities, countries, and regions that would otherwise uh, be in a kind of debt spiral where they cannot necessarily develop sustainably. Uh, we know that as climate change advances and, and pressures and costs pile up, that's going to be increasingly important. And so the places where historically mainstream finance hasn't wanted to go can actually become attractive because we make the right decisions about food system adaptation, because we make the right decisions about integrated data systems and multidimensional performance metrics, and because we build value across all of those areas simultaneously. When we can show that that value is, is there, that hasn't been visible to the marketplace before, we can then start to show that the best place to put your money is the place that delivers not one, not two, but five, 10, and 20 different urgently needed benefits. And I'll just stop there for now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for sharing that perspective. And um, the key message there is the the delivery of multiple benefits and, and I like that interconnection that you know adaptation by addressing adaptation properly we can benefit from other areas as well so thank you very much for sharing that um, as I said earlier um, if anyone in the audience would like to share with us any experience want to make a comment want to ask a question you're welcome so if you want to raise your hand, if there are any questions, um, they will be welcome. So this is your chance. We have one person. Is there a mic there? Not, we, we can share one with you here. <laughs> Thank you for your 
Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting, uh, all of the presentations. Uh, so this is actually a question uh, for the lady from uh, Kenya uh, on, on climate information services. So farmers um, need to make decisions in the short, medium and long term. Um, so we have worked with uh, Catholic Relief Services, I'm from Catholic Relief Service, trying to understand what type of, of information they need for short term. So for example, you know, just before the harvest, uh, based on the information that you can get from forecast and things like that, so that's a short term. Then there's a medium term, which is sort of the planning, yearly planning circle. How can we, what type of climate information can we feed into that? And then there's a long term, so you talked about water harvesting, that's sort of a long term solutions. How are you using climate information for that? I guess based on scenarios and also an understanding of historical trends and things like that. So can you just talk a bit okay. about how how uh, you use climate information for this type of decisions? Okay, that's very clear, thank you. Anybody else? This one here? Can Sorry, we don't have anyone here to transfer the, to the mic. Um, yeah, good morning. Thank you so much for the presentation and um, the speaker's effort. Mine is really about taking things to scale. Um, many times we hear about these initiatives, pockets of initiatives, and we all know that for adaptation to work, we need to start talking about scale. And I'm just wondering if anyone on the panel can share beyond these initiatives to look at how we are dealing with scale, including how we bring in private sector investment. Thank you. Great, that's also clear, thank you. One final question or comment, we'll take three. Yeah, the gentleman at the back. Sorry, you have to come and collect the mic. Yeah, hi, I'm Pete Falloon from the UK Met Office and University of Bristol. There's a question to the panel, really, actually. In the UK, we find um, progress in adaptation in agri-food systems is not happening at the pace that we really need it to, and we are seeing increasing extreme events. I'm intrigued uh, to, to, to hear what the panel's reflections are on, uh, on what the barriers are in your regions in terms of people actually taking up adaptation. Thank you. Great. No, thank you very much. Um, you can have the mic here, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll ask each, each panelist to, to respond briefly to one or, or more of the questions you, you heard. Uh, and then will be, that will be your, your final intervention as well. We have only 10 minutes to go. So please, very brief. We'll, I'll start with you. Okay. So question is very interesting, especially in the Mongolian situation is a little bit uh, difficult right now, especially adaptation and mitigation decision in, in, in terms of the agriculture and the section of NDC. Because in the Mongolian economy is based on livestock and all the agriculture and plus in the mining and very small percent of the trees. So number of the livestock increasing year by year, that is the very big the challenge to Mongolian society. Then the reduction of the uh, reduction or the sustainable the number of the livestock is the one of the challenge, especially the, especially in the mitigation of the emission, also in the adaptation of the actions. Although in the government of Mongolia is introducing the national adaptation plan, jointly work with the UNF and the FU and also some of the source funding the source from the GCF. And so for this in the project also is introducing and trying to make the some of the uh, good in the pilot in the projects for the agriculture and the sector. Although in the GF, GCF, or other in the funding and the resources mainly in the focusing on sustainable in the agriculture in Mongolia related in the projects. But the issue is that also in the extent that we have challenge because we are an agriculture country. Great, thank you. Well, uh, in response to the, the, his question, uh, Panama has a program uh, related to food, water, uh, water footprint and carbon footprint, where also we uh, work with some crops where we estimated the use, uh, the water they used to, to get the, the product. So also we try to involve the different um, uh, private sector to how to improve the value of this product that the, the different community uh, produce. So we try to um, have a certification we are working on 
uh, produce a um, certification where they have increased the value so we can export the product to another country or also the product from outside the country came in this, the same value. So uh, the different uh, private sector try to get more involved, try to understand better because uh, they, they produce the community, reduce the emission also during the, all the process, but also try to um, ha get um, a better uh, use the water. So that is uh, the experience from the part of Panama, how we can improve from the private sector. Okay, thank you. Maybe I will start by uh, the experience of private sector uh, in my country. Uh, in adaptation, it's really difficult because when you want to bring the uh, private sector in the climate change area, first you must to secure that they are going to, to, to have benefits. So they are more, uh, their intervention is more focused on uh, renewable energy. And in this country, we have around more than 10 uh, wind. Uh, with one wind plant and uh, solar plants where private sector is uh, really engaged. But those electricity also is uh, having a lot of interest and benefits in agriculture because they are, it is used for water mobilization, for market gardening, something like that. And uh, at, at adaptation at scale is sometimes very difficult with some sectors. Uh, for example, with water, yes, we are having uh, some large scale uh, projects because the problematic is sometimes uh, unique. But in land degradation and forestry, it's sometimes difficult because it is de depending on context. And we have the project of the Great Green Wall, which is targeting large scale, but the result also depends on the cultures, on the areas, and we are learning from a site to another one and seeing how we can emphasize in every site on uh, existing and what can work. But uh, land degradation at large scale sometimes is very difficult. And as I said, from an eco uh, ecological region to another one, we don't have same uh, issues, we don't have same uh, process. So sometimes we learn, uh, we are learning uh, from a site to a site. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, to your question, uh, we do have a number of tools that we use. In the region, decisions for farmers are made on a seasonal level. Um, so uh, participatory scenario planning, which is something that we do at a sub-national level where we bring in actors from the different sectors with the farmers, with the indigenous knowledge forecasters to give the seasonal forecast and what its implication will be. And that we have piloted in the region, particularly in Kenya for over a decade. And in Kenya now, through the National Framework of Climate Services, which was launched about a month ago to answer his question, is one of the things that they've included. So the participatory scenario planning process will now be part of the National um, Framework for Climate Services for Kenya, at least. And that's one way that we've been able to scale up. So we've moved from a pilot, and now that it's part of the framework, we're hoping the country will be able to integrate it throughout to other uh, sites as well. But for the community specifically, Kali, another tool that we use is the participatory integrated climate services for agriculture which uh, is a tool that we use with the university, what university of reading, and talks about what you want, what you're basically saying in terms of planning before the season, long before the season, just before the season, during the season, and reviews at the end of the season. But it's a bit costly, time consuming, but we have piloted it with FAO in the three sites as well. Okay, thank you. Joseph? Uh, yes, so, uh, you know, I. The participatory element of uh, is so important, and just a couple of things. One, I think we're talking about a shift in practice for uh, growers. Regenerative and agroecological practices are a form of adaptation. They change the land itself so that it is better prepared. Um, materials, what kind of seeds, crops, what kind of soil are you working with? How do you value ecology? Uh, as part of the process rather than just something that is there naturally. Business models have to change. Um, expanded land value, for instance, based on its soil biomass content, based on its resilience against uh, wind and weather and climate shocks, 
Um, the value chain needs to evolve. There need to be more providers of the relevant uh, services and opportunities that are needed in a climate altered world. And then data, how do we know what we're doing? And can we get data services and the benefits of downscaled, localized, climate-related information to people who wouldn't have had it before, but by having it can now make use of uh, investments that would come for climate and nature benefits. And then to really motivate the private sector, there's this question of linking up these different elements. So linking Earth Systems data to financial data so that you can see that by doing both, you actually do better rather than just pursuing gain at cost of the environment, which will ultimately hurt you later when the whole of society and the whole of the planet have lost value. Um, that leads to a greater investability of regenerative and agroecological practices, and it can specifically lead to investability of the small and medium-sized enterprises that deliver these adaptation services. So that's, that's where you know, we think from the good food finance perspective, if you can put together these pieces, embrace the complexity of the challenge and start to show where value emerges from these innovations. Um, and again, leaning on the fact that stakeholders need to be involved so that they can make sure the process is as intelligent as possible about the context that they're in, then you can get to the place where the private sector has a way to simply choose the financial instruments that work for them to support that uh, mobilization. Um, and ideally, they're responding to policy changes that invite them to do that as well. Okay, uh, thank you. Joseph, while, while you're still there, um, I'll, I'll finish with this question that I'd like everyone to, to answer, the question from the colleague from the Met Office. If from your perspective, in your experience, can you name just one barrier, one barrier that you think has been really important in preventing the scaling up of, of adaptation? So please be, be brief, just one barrier. It could be just one word. And I'll start with you, Joseph. I think the biggest barrier is that the places where adaptation is most needed are often vulnerable places that are considered risky by financial interests. And therefore, they're sort of left to fend for themselves until there is national level attention on their need. That hinders getting to scale because... Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Linda? And you can pass the mic. Uh, I think the greatest barrier is still the siloed approach. I think if we look at the global stock take, it did say that we we are still working in silos and uh, and we're still focusing particularly in our region on agricultural productivity and not looking at um, vulnerability as a whole. So I think that that is still our biggest barrier, particularly in the Horn. Yeah, for us, I can say it's uh, the access to climate finance that is limiting and also seeing in that area how we can mobilize more finance, even beyond the climate change, because we have desertification, we have biodiversity issues, to see how we can put all this landscape of uh, financing systems to tackle the uh, matters related to adaptation on the ground, because they are all linked. Thanks. Well, um, also the financial, but also I think the, the agroclimatic information, ability or access of that information to take real real um, actions to take more planification based on that science information. Yes, so the national level, okay, the intersectoral cooperation is most yeah, challenge, I think so. And also plus the capacity building among the community, for example, herders or crop production, the sectors, that is very important for the climate change. Right. No, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for sharing with us your experience and your expertise from your countries. And, and thank you, Joe, for joining us as well. Um, and thank you, everyone. I hope you found this helpful. I hope you learned something from experiences and the barriers that are still remaining. So again, have a look at the, the case studies in the report. And there is a lot to, to take on there. And I hope you'll find it useful. So please join in me in, in thanking all the, the panelists here. Thank you. Thank you.